Hello, Professor Tian. This is Jin. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Dr. Tan, do you have any problem for the audio? Oh yes, yeah, I can hear you. I thought then, uh, could you move to the first slide, the previous one? Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can, but I can also hear echoes. Hello, is this better now? Yeah, much better, yeah. Uh, could, could you move to the previous slide? Is this the first slide? Oh, oh yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, let's get started. Uh, yeah, it's uh, nine o'clock. And so uh, welcome to my uh, to our seminar. Uh, my name is Jin Lu, um, the co-chair of uh, Dashu Virtual Journal Club. Uh, we're honored to have um, Professor Tian here uh, today. Uh, before we get into the presentation, uh, I 
will give you a like, quick view, overview of Dashu. Um, Dashu is a, a file 1C3 uh, nonprofit organization. Uh, we have the tax exam status by a federal and uh, by California state. Uh, we have many strategic partners, including SFASA, um, BAES, uh, CABS, and so on. Uh, we are a very young organization, uh, founded about like uh, three years ago. Uh, the good news is our membership is free. Um, as long as you attend any of our events, you will automatically become a member. Uh, our administrative cost is very low. Um, of our uh, uh, all of our work, uh, all of us work as volunteers. And so if you are interested in funding us, all of the funding goes to uh, serve the community. Uh, the goal of this organization is to provide a virtual community for people interested in um, data science, and uh, we can help each other in the com community. Uh, we organize uh, uh, all kinds of events and uh, uh, and and uh, and we're also actively seeking members, uh, also money, so if uh, you want to uh, response. Uh, could you go to the next slide? Uh, so I will talk a little bit more about the Virtual Journal Club. Uh, we try to uh, do it monthly. Uh, so if you go to our website, you can see um, a blue Virtual Journal Club logo. Uh, you can click on it. You will find all of our previous general clubs, so all the slides and the videos. Um, and uh, we also share slides and uh, recordings if uh, the speakers give us uh, the permission to do that. Uh, currently, we have like more than 10 general clubs uh, on the website. And uh, for the general club, um, we also need your help uh, in many ways. Uh, if you are interested in hearing uh, particular topics, uh, you can let us know. Uh, if you uh, are working on some data science to uh, topic and want to uh, share with us, uh, please let us know. Uh, if you like uh, our general club and you can help us uh, to spread the word and broadcasting our activities and events. And uh, yeah, that's uh, how you can help. Uh, could you go to the next slide? Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm very honored to introduce today's uh, our speaker and the topic. Uh, the topic for today is uh, survival analysis methods um, for non-proportional hazard. And so it's about how can we use uh, uh, restricted mean survival time to deal with non-proportional hazard. Um, so here, I will also give an uh, introduction about Dr. Tian. Uh, Dr. Tian is an associate professor at the D Department of uh, Biomedical Data Science at uh, Stanford University. Dr. Tian uh, got uh, his uh, bachelor and master's degree in mathematics from Nankai University. And then he received uh, his doctor of science in biostatistics from Harvard University. Uh, he has a uh, considerable experience in statistical methodology. Uh, methodological research on um, planning large uh, epidemiological uh, studies, um, performing data management for uh, randomized um, clinical trials, and uh, also conducting applied data analysis. Um, his current research interest uh, includes developing statistical methods in survival analysis, and uh, also uh, semi-parametric regression modeling high-dimensional data analysis, um, precision medicine, and uh, meta-analysis. Um, so he has published more than 200 um, peer-reviewed journal articles, and also um, currently serves as uh, uh, associate editor of uh, Chance um, Biometrics and Statistics in Medicine. So without overdue, I will give the fork uh, to Dr. Tian, so that him give the speak. Okay, thank you. Next slide. Yeah, Dr. Tian, you can uh, go ahead. Okay. Hey, uh, I cannot hear you, I don't know why. 
Hello, can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Now I can. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so. so So, so Jing, thank you very much for the for the for the nice introduction, and uh, um, and this is also a an euro experience for me, first time giving a talk virtually over the internet rather than uh, in a regular seminar rooms. So my understanding is at the, at the end of the talk we are going to have uh, some. You can ask some questions by click the the chat uh, box here, uh, but uh, otherwise I will continue. Uh, proceed to my talk, and uh, uh, we can reserve the question to the end of the uh, hour. Um, so, so today's uh, today's topic is about uh, an alternative to proportional hazard uh, model and um, in survival analysis. And specifically, uh, I uh, we are promoting the idea of using restricted mean survival time, so-called RMST, uh, as the alternative appealing alternative to proportional hazards model. Uh, so without further ado, let me let me go to the first slide. So so what is the survival analysis? So especially survival analysis is very important in randomized clinical trials. Uh, actually it's very simple. So the objective there is uh, comparing a treatment uh, with a standard of care uh, in terms of uh, their effect on the on some kind of time to event of interest. So it does not have does not necessarily has to be survival time. It can be time to uh, other events such as uh, uh, disease progression, time to uh, recurrence, uh, time to infection, so on and so forth. So as long as the uh, event time type out outcome, then it fell into the category of survival analysis. And the analytical goal is to compare the distribution of the survival time in the treatment arm with that in the control arm. So again, there are two types of comparisons. Normally, if the, in the superiority trial, we want to show that the survival distribution in the, treated, in the treatment arm is stochastically longer or bigger than the distribution in the, um, uh, the survival distribution in the control arm. In the equivalence trial or non-inferiority trial, we want to show those two distributions are, are very close to each other. So, so let, let's uh, give a brief review about the traditional approach. The traditional survival analysis is based on the so-called hazard ratio. Uh, the basic idea is we try to summarize the distribution using the survival distribution using some, some functions, which is a hazard function in this case. Hazard function essentially is the conditional probability or the limiting of the conditional probability. The, the, survive, the, the event of clinical interest will occur in the next instantaneous moment given the person still survived or has not experienced uh, the events by this, by, uh, by this time for now. So, uh, so mathematically, the hazard function is equal to the density function divided by the survival function as long as the, the survival distribution has a continuous density function, which is normally the case. And uh, so, the, so the problem of that is the hazard function is a still, uh, still a function. So that's a, mathematically is infinite dimensional parameter. So when we want to compare the survival distribution between two arms, uh, if we want to use hazard function, that means we want to compare two hazard functions. And we want to, uh, so ideally, we want to summarize the difference between two hazard functions using a single parameter or at least a finite dimensional parameter. We don't want to present a function, right? Because statistics is about a summarization. A function is not a very effective summarization. So, so that, I think, promotes the idea of a proportional hazard. So in the proportional hazard model originally proposed by Professor Cox is uh, assuming uh, the two hazard functions are proportional to each other. So, for example, the hazard function in the treated arm is lambda one, and lambda one of t equals to the uh, hazard function in the control arm, which is equal to lambda zero of t times a constant, which is e raised to the power beta. That means, you know, the hazard function is, uh, you know, 
decrease. For example, if the treatment is effective, the hazard function in the treated arm is 20% lower than the hazard function in the control arm for every time point, or at least for the every time point in the interval of uh, interest. Okay, so the Cox model was used for, uh, was proposed for estimating this uh, ratio. And that ratio is uh, a summary of the comparison between two survival distributions. So for example, if we consider the hazard ratio of the treatment arm versus the control arm, if the hazard ratio is less than one, that means the, uh, the survival distribution in the treated arm is stochastically greater, and that shows the superiority if the survival, if in this case, if the event time is, is a good thing, right? So the longer, the better. And if the hazard ratio is very close to one, that means the two survival functions are very close to each other. That is the corresponding to the equivalence trial or non-inferiority trial. So, uh, so you can see uh, uh, the hazard ratio based inference is uh, the whole purpose is to estimate the ratio of the two hazard functions. And uh, the ratio of two hazard functions normally is also a function. But in the proportional hazard assumption, we assume this ratio is a constant. So that is the assumption to facilitate our summary of the data or the summary of the contrast between two survival functions. So of course, though that brings the biggest limitation of the hazard ratio, right? So, uh, so, so that is, a, we are, when we assume a proportional hazard assumption, uh, the, uh, that is assumption that is not necessarily true in practice. And uh, besides that, there's, a, uh, there's a, there are several other problems. So, so for example, if the proportional hazard assumption is violated, then the estimate hazard ratio uh, is hard to interpret. Uh, sometimes people interpret that hazard ratio as the average of the hazard ratio of the, each of the time points as weighted average. But the weight will depend on the sensory distribution which is a nuisance parameter, right? So imagine you run uh, the same trial twice, but somehow people drop off from your trial or your enrollment of the patients are different as the enrollment pattern, but otherwise you target on the same patient population and uh, using the same comparison, the same treatment, the same control, uh, your hazard ratio will, will be different uh, beyond stochastic variability because the sensory distribution are different if the proportional hazard assumption uh, is violated. So that is the big problem. Uh, and also, of course, uh, you, in that case, the, the power of your test might suffer. So, uh, uh, so that's the, and, and also, uh, I also want to emphasize there's the beyond those, even the proportional hazard assumption is correct, uh, might be correct. There's still some uh, limitations like the, in terms of interpretation. The hazard function is actually very difficult to understand for common people. You can try uh, to explain hazard function to physicians, to patients, to even medical researchers. It's very hard for them, I mean, to understand what exactly the hazard function is, which essentially is the limiting of the conditional probability, right? So it's a difficult to understand. And also, uh, when we compare two hazard functions, uh, we report hazard ratio, but we do not report the reference hazard function, not without a good reason, because the hazard function itself is very difficult to, to estimate. You have to use some smoothing or splines, and uh, you might have different shapes if the smoothing parameter are uh, used or different. So, so normally we say hazard ratio is a 30 percent uh, reduction, right? I mean, say the treatment versus the control. But without presenting what is the header function in the control arm, we really don't know what is actually the gain we have. That's why oftentimes, uh, if you look at the, uh, the clinical paper reporting clinical trial results, people report hazard ratio and then switch back to say, okay, uh, the median survival time was uh, prolonged from uh, uh, one year to uh, one half year. So, so that you can see that information. Uh, people understand uh, because you know otherwise you have median survival of one year in the standard care. Now it becomes uh, uh, one, one year plus six months, and the six months 
actual life is the, is the treatment benefit. But if you just tell people the hazard ratio equal to 0.3, people cannot, cannot understand exactly what this hazard ratio implies for their life, right? Uh, and, and lastly, hazard ratio might not lie well with the graphical presentation of survival curve. Uh, I say this uh, because uh, what I mean is, for example, if you plot the two survival curves and I ask you what is the hazard ratio corresponding to these two survival curves, I think a very, very few people can give me a concrete answer. Um, and sometimes the two survival curves are very close to each other, but the hazard ratio can be very impressive, I mean, 0.5, 0 0.6, that's 40% reduction or 50% reduction in hazards. And sometimes the two hazard uh, curves uh, are quite apart from each other, but the hazard ratio actually is not that impressive. For example, hazard ratio of 2.8. So there's now a very simple one-to-one -one correspondence between the contrast of the survival curve and the hazard ratio. So all those are limitations. Of course, I want to say the biggest limitation is the proportional hazard assumption might be problematic. It's a very strong assumption. And if it's violated in practice, um, then we are in trouble. So what is the alternative in that case? Uh, so if there's no censoring, we would use the difference in mean and the median, right? For example, mean survival time, uh, you know, was prolonged by receiving this treatment by two years. So that is very concrete information. But if there's a censoring, we oftentimes cannot estimate the mean and the median. As you know, the censoring prevents us to estimate the entire survival distribution. So in that case, actually, a very simple alternative is to estimate the restricted mean survival time, which, is, uh, which can be defined as the expectation of the truncated survival time by a time point tau. So, so, uh, so, that's, uh, so here is the, the definition of the RMST. So the interpretation of RMST actually is quite simple, actually it's simpler than the hazard function. So that is simply the average survival time during this period of zero to tau. So that is, or, or the expected life time during uh, time window zero tau, right? So graphically, the RMST is also uh, very appealing. That is the area under the survival curve. Um, so I will I will show you the graph here. So you can see here I plotted the two survival functions, and the area under the survival function, for example, this this area, is the RMST for the for the black survival curve, and here the area under the red curve is the RMST corresponding to the red survival curve. So because of this very nice relationship, we can estimate the difference between two RMST very easily using simply the integration of uh, the difference between two survival functions, right? So, uh, so that is the true parameter. In order to estimate the RMST up to time points tau, we simply replace the survival function by their kappa minor estimate. So the d hat you can show is a consistent estimator for the true difference between two RMST. And also the d hat will be asymptotically normal, uh, uh, asymptotically uh, follows a normal distribution, okay, with the variance, with the estimable variance. Uh, and here you can see the difference uh, between two RMST essentially is the area between two survival curves. So the area between curves uh, is very easy uh, to remember acronyms, American board Chinese, right? So, so you can just uh, see uh, very intuitively if this uh, uh, sandwiched area is very big, that's corresponding to big difference between two RMST and that corresponding to uh, two very well separated survival curves. So unlike the hazard ratio, here the difference in RMST directly, directly reflects uh, the difference between two survival curves. So here is a, a very simple summary about what we have talked so far uh, for, comparison, uh, for, for comparison between the hazard ratio versus the difference in RMST. So the hazard ratio is a semi-parametric because it assumes the 
the ratio of two has a function is the constant, although at the left, uh, it, it leaves the, uh, the hazard function itself completely unspecified, right? But the difference in RMST is completely non-parametric. We do not have any constraints whatsoever about the shapes or the relationship between two survival curves. We can estimate their difference non-parametrically. And uh, the hazard ratio oftentimes do not provide a reference hazard function, right? And the difference in RMST, uh, we can provide an interpretable reference level. We can talk about the RMST increases from two years to three years, right? The two years in the control arm uh, of RMS for RMST would serve as the reference level. So you know the gain, how much your gain is compared with the reference level. And the hazard, fun, hazard ratio uh, might, depends, uh, might depend on the sensor distribution if the proportional hazard assumption is violated because in that case, the hazard ratio would be a weighted average of hazard ratio across all the time points, and the weight will depend on the sensory distribution. But the difference in RMST does not depend on the sensory distribution, at least asymptotically. And also, the hazard ratio does not depend on the actual survival time. If you are familiar with the Cox model, you would notice that the hazard ratio only depends on the rank of the failure time, of the people observed uh, failure time. So it doesn't matter if the you count the time, you know, you square all the survival times. You, if you estimate the hazard ratio based on the squared uh, survival time, you get exactly the same hazard ratio. Uh, so you don't have the unit of the survival time, right? Uh, and the, but the difference in RMST obviously depends on the actual survival time. We are talking about two years to three years or, or two months to three months. Uh, they will be different. And the, for the hazard ratio, they are the same. And uh, lastly, actually it's not a difference, but a similarity. But the people oftentimes uh, have some misunderstanding. That is uh, both hazard ratio and the difference in RMST depends on the study duration or depends on the time window we are talking about, which is uh, pretty obvious for the case of RMST because uh, the definition of RMST uh, requires to specify a time window zero tau, right? So we're estimating the RMST within this time window. But the hazard ratio sometimes will estimate it without explicitly specifying uh, any time interval, right? So we just have hazard ratio, uh, for example, 0.7 or 0.6. Unlike we're talking about three years uh, RMST up to 36 months, right? So, but actually has a ratio also estimated within a time window if there's a censoring. For example, if your trial conducted like five years trial, then, our, then the hazard ratio actually is estimated has a ratio within a time interval of five years. So we cannot simply generalize that has a ratio to, uh, to time points beyond five years. And uh, this oftentimes, uh, this fact is oftentimes ignored in practice. People thinking has the ratio can last forever. For example, even your trial only lasts for two years and you estimate a has a ratio of 0.7 and people will assume this has a ratio of 0.7 will apply for patients receiving your treatment for, for example, five years, which is not true. We don't have information about has a ratio at that time point. Uh, the RMST force you to uh, make this limitation clear. Uh, the hazard ratio is a somewhat um, high this fact. So, so here is a very simple example showing the advantage of using RMST and equivalence trial. So as you know, uh, to demonstrate the equivalence of two treatments, we oftentimes uh, estimate a hazard ratio and uh, construct the 95% confidence interval. If the result confidence interval is within an interval, around one, then we would close, we would claim these two arms are equivalent. For example, if the confidence interval is, is uh, within the interval from 0.7 to 1.3, then we, we say it's okay, right? So that's a typical approach. And this is a, a, a real trial to demonstrate a, a new anti-diabetic drugs uh, cardiovascular safety profile compared with the placebo. And the end point is the C, cardiovascular-related deaths 
am I and the non-fatal ischemic stroke. And this is a pretty big trial, as you can see. We have a lot, like 16,000 patients with one-to-one -one randomization ratio, and the patients were followed for up to three years. So considering the enrollment time, so this is pretty, uh, pretty uh, big trial. And the estimate hazard ratio is one, which is good news for the company. And the, the confidence interval of the hazard ratio is 0.9 to 1.12. So it's a pretty narrow confidence interval centered at one. And uh, the, the threshold for hazard ratio, uh, for equivalent, for hazard ratio in this equivalent trial required by FDA is 1.3. So basically, if, you have, if your confidence interval of hazard ratio fall into the interval 0.7 to 1.3, you are fine. You can claim equivalent. And in this case, we are good, right? But if we want, if we want to ask a few more questions, why we choose 1.3, right? I mean, that's, as we said, hazard ratio itself does not require a specification of the reference level. So in this case, for example, it's the cardiovascular event rate in the placebo arm. If that rate is very low, then 30% or even 40% additional hazard might not pose an important risk in practice, right? Suppose your drug is a very uh, effective in controlling the glucose level, right? So then uh, maybe if the baseline rate is very low, so for example, one out of, I just make it up, one out of 10,000 patients, then even with your drug, you have 1.5 event rate out of 10,000 patients. That's a fair price to pay. Although high the ratio in that case would be 50% roughly, right? And if, on the other hand, if the event rate is not very low, then 30% increase, uh, which is the boundary uh, allowed by the FDA criteria might not be acceptable, right? Uh, so, so, so here is a, a limitation about uh, uh, the question about why do we set up this threshold? Because we don't have the reference information. That reference, this threshold itself can be a problem. Nobody understands a hazard ratio of 1.3 is so too high or acceptable. And also, uh, for this case, the 95% confidence interval, uh, the width of the interval for hazard ratio depends on the number of events, not on the you know, exposure time and, uh, and the number of patients. So if you only have five events uh, or 10 events, the length of the hazard ratio was pretty much determined. And uh, you can see if you follow, if the drug is very, very safe, that means you follow a large a group of patients for a long time, and you still have very few uh, cardiovascular events, right? And uh, that actually is supposed to be very safe, a signal for a very safe drug. But actually in this case, as we just said, you will have a very wide confidence interval, right? Because you have very few events. If in the worst case you have zero events, then it's good news for the patients. Nobody experienced any bad events, but it's a very bad news for you because you're confidence interval will be from, from zero to positive infinity. And you cannot claim equivalent. You cannot claim your very safe drug is the safe, right? And of course, last, last question is the portion of hazards assumption can be problematic. If this assumption was violated, then nobody knows what your confidence interval for hazard ratio really estimates. Uh, so if we, switch gear to RMST based analysis for this kind of, for this kind of comparison, you can see that uh, the hazard ratio in this case, for example, for the entire data set, the hazard ratio is 0 0.9 to 1.1, the confidence interval. But if you consider the difference in RMST up to um, 900 days, that's, uh, that's uh, more like two and a half years, then the, actually the, the difference uh, the confidence interval for the difference in RMST up to day 900 is negative five days to positive four days, right? So here you can have a very intuitive sense. You would say, look, this difference is just a very small, right? Plus minus four or five days, do I care? Probably I don't, right? I mean, either it's more than four days or less than five days. And um, the nice thing is if you only use a tiny fraction of the data, say 15% of the data, that is the 2,474 patients, then the confidence interval for hazard ratio will be, becomes very wide. 
So from 0.76 to 1.36, that means if you follow the protocol, then you would not be able to claim equivalence. But if you look at the RMST difference, that's the confidence interval is plus or minus 12 days, slightly more than one week. I think in this case, people have, if people, if the physician and the patients understand the, uh, the benefit or the treatment benefit uh, of the, of, for glu glucose control, then they, they, can evaluate, they can assess whether, you know, uh, 12 days uh, less uh, for RMST, right? 12 days, you know, in terms of difference in RMST, is that a big deal or not, right? So uh, again, as I, as I said before, for hazard ratio, it's very hard for people to balance the cost with the benefit. You know, nobody knows 1.3 can treat for what, right? Now, we have a very concrete idea. So the RMST can be uh, shortened by 15 days, uh, by 12 days, right? In the worst case, based on the 95% confidence interval, would that be acceptable for the patient population over 900 days? It seems 12 days is uh, relatively a small price to pay uh, in this case. Uh, so here, if you want to use RMST, uh, you will see immediately there's uh, several issues, or actually many issues. Uh, for example, how to design a study, right, based on RMST. We used to design study based on hazard ratio. For example, we have a very nice formula based on the number of events to backwards calculating the sample size, the power, and also we can do group sequential, right? A lot of things we, nice things we can do. Uh, but how about RMST? And uh, also, uh, if you are, uh, if you are uh, a statistician for a randomized clinical trial, you, you will have concern about the power, right? Because ultimately you want for a small p-value, you want your, your trial to be successful. Uh, then, you know, you need to, if the RMST-based uh, analysis has a very small, very little power, then you would not want to use RMST, no matter how, how wonderful I say RMST is. And also, there's another question people oftentimes criticizing RMST is how, to, how can you select the truncation time point, that's the time point top, right? Why do you select 900 days? Why not 800 days? Why not 1,000 days, right? Uh, and especially the, the regulatory uh, agency, including FDA and EMAR, they really concern about uh, the people gaming the system by selecting uh, the truncation time points most favorable to their observed data, which, which is the problem. And also, how to perform regression analysis adjusting for covariance. For example, using analysis of covariance, right? In the hazard ratio case, we have Cox proportional hazards model. But if you want to use, use RMST, which model you should use? And, and also, how to handle competing risk, recurrence events, you know, and other complex settings. Uh, we all have, you know, very, for example, competing risk, we have cost specific. A proportional hazard model. We also have, uh, you know, a grace like cumulative instance uh, a regression model for competing risk. But if you want to use RMST, which model can you use? And also, how can you deal with the rare events, right? Yeah, like in the previous example, if the number of the events is so low uh, and uh, and the asymptotic inference becomes problematic for even Kaplan-Meier estimates, how can you make inference based on RMST? Well, to be fair, that is also a problem for, uh, for hazard ratio. But uh, if you say RMST has a good advantage against hazard ratio, if the number of events is low, because the confidence interval of the hazard ratio, uh, the, the, the length of the confidence interval depends on the number of events. If you say that is the advantage for RMST, but if the number of events becomes too small, uh, what can you say about the, valid the validity of the inference based on RMST, right? So there are all questions I will try to address one by one uh, in this talk. So firstly, let's, let's think about study design, okay? The simplest, so we have to consider many things for if you want to design a study based on RMST, right? For example, what is the meaningful follow-up time, which is the time window, the clinically meaningful time window, right? For example, for some cancer, if you think the five-year 
uh, five during five years, you know, if the people don't have, uh, uh, if the people do not have, uh, still survive, then probably the patient was considered cured, right? Then in that case, probably you want to choose the time point tau, five years, right? So you have to consider what is clinically meaningful follow-up time. If you, in that case, if you only conduct your study, uh, allow you to estimate uh, RMST up to year one, that study might not be very, interesting even the result is a positive because people don't know what happens after year one and also you want to consider the reference survival curve and our corresponding rmst in the placebo group in the standard of care arm right so you need to know the entire survival curve rather than just the event rate right in the uh, you might assuming like exponential distribution you might get that information from historical control uh, but you have to know the entire survival curve in order to uh, design the trial. And also you need to consider uh, what is clinically meaningful and the plausible treatment effect, uh, basically where your survival curve would be if you apply the new treatment. You know, you have to, you have just like uh, in the, uh, the study design based on hazard ratio, you have to assume your hazard ratio is 0.7 if your trial is successful, right? So here you have to assume, but here instead of a single number, you need to consider where the survival curve would be. So you can see uh, immediately we ask more for uh, design this kind of study. And also, of course, you have to consider the enrollment pattern and the sensory distribution, which is no different from, for example, the designing a trial based on hazard ratio. So here, once you have all those uh, factors considered or specified, then here you, we do have a sample size calculation formula. It's a, it's a little bit intimidating. It's a very complex formula, but believe me, uh, if you plug in those uh, uh, functions and the dual integration, it's not very bad. Um, and here the alpha is the type one error and the beta is type two error. And the pi zero is the at risk of proportion and S zero is the survival function and uh, P0 and the P1 is the randomization proportion. If it's a one-to-one -one randomization, then both should be 0.5, okay? Um, you can use R or other program to do this integration. This is not too bad. So here I give you an example. So, I, so in this case, uh, we assume uh, two survival distributions uh, in two arms follows a Weibull distribution, but we're purposely making the proportional hazard assumption violated by choosing different shape parameter in this y balls. And uh, the study lasts of 40 months with 20 months enrollment period. And also we are assuming, uh, in addition to the administrative censoring caused by the enrollment, there's also a natural drop-off uh, rate uh, following exponential distribution, right? And we use the previous formula. We can see, in this case, if we want to use the hazard ratio based on test, you would need 14,000 patients per hour. And if you use RMST based on test, you only need 600 patients per hour. Because in this case, the proportional hazards assumption was violated. So actually the hazard ratio based on test, the log rank test actually suffered uh, in terms of power. And the question is whether those two numbers are reliable or not, right? You give me a sample size, but I don't know whether this sample size indeed give me the power I desired. So actually we run a simulation uh, using those, those uh, as calculated sample size to backwards simulate the power, right? So actually in this case, based on 5,000 simulations, we can see the power is very close to 80% for both hazard ratio and also the previous formula, the, the formula I gave you in this slide. So this formula is reliable if you can specify correctly uh, all the survival function, okay? So we repeated the same exercise. We, in this case, we're assuming the proportional hazard assumption uh, satisfied with the hazard ratio of 0.6 between these two variables. And uh, you can see in this case, the, if you use, want to use log rank test, then the sample size would be 351 per arm. And if you want to use RMST, you need uh, you know, seven more patients per arm. And again, we use simulation to verify the power. So the power is uh, both in both cases are very close to 81%. So again, that verifies this uh, uh, 
formula for power calculation is uh, pretty reliable. So, so that now you might ask, how about sequential group sequential design and uh, you know more complex study design? So we know we can do this using based on hazard ratio. We also can do this using the RMST. Uh, the only only trick is the truncation time uh, for RMST at the interim analysis might or might not be the same as the truncation time point of the final analysis. You have to be flexible. So for example, at the interim, you might you might test the difference between RMST up to year three. But in the final analysis with longer follow-up, you want to test the difference in RMST up to year four, right, for example. And all those results were presented very nicely in this paper by Maria and uh, and Stiatis. Um, so so you can you can you can find the uh, the reference you know the, the the detailed reference by looking by checking this up in biometrics. Um, so so as I said, people my concerns about power right. So I I design a study using RMST. And you design study using log rank test. Um, we don't want to the study based on RMST suffers uh, too much in terms of power. Okay, so let's take a close look. Uh, so let's just skip this one. It's a relative. It's a theoretical result, basically talking about some particle relative efficiency. Um, I think we can also skip this one. Uh, so here essentially is the result. So so basically. Uh, in order to compare the power of two tests, we oftentimes using a symptotic relative efficiency, which is the ratio of two non-centrality parameters. The ratio, ratio of uh, the square of uh, two non-centrality parameters. And uh, if the, in this case, we use RMST based the test versus hazard ratio based the test. If this uh, ARE is less than one, that means hazard ratio log run test is more powerful. If it's greater than one, that means RMST is more powerful. Otherwise, they are equivalent. And this ratio can be interpreted as inverse ratio of the sample size needed uh, for two tests to have the same power under the same alternative. So you can see if the ARE is 0.5, that means the hazard ratio based the log run test only needs 50% of the sample sizes as the sample size required by the RMST based the test. So that's a big saving. That means log run test the more powerful in that case, right? So this ratio is uh, has a very meaningful interpretation in practice. So we, we tried several scenarios. The first scenario, of course, is based on the is assuming the proportional hazard assumption is true. So in this case, uh, the log run test we know is the semi-parametric most efficient test. That that is a test you simply cannot beat. Uh, so no surprising, the ARE all less than one. But you can see those ARES, uh, you know, sometimes pretty close to one. Sometimes it's, uh, even in the worst case, it's 0 0.8, right? It's 0 0.77, very close to 0.8. So in this case, the event rate actually is very low. So that means uh, by the end of the study, almost nobody fails. Uh, but you do have a hazard ratio. And in this case, the um, you can argue uh, if you design a trial based on the RMST, uh, you would need 20% uh, or 23%, 24% more patients than the log run test, which is a, it's a, it's a price, right? But if the event rate is not very low, for example, at the end of the study, uh, 50 or 70% of the patients fail, then you would expect that the ARE is, is uh, close or above 0.9. And then you know the RMST, although it's less powerful, but the you but in order to recover the power, you just need a 10% more patient. So it seems a reasonable price. Uh, in other cases, for example, if the proportional hazard assumption were violated, so in this case, the hazard ratio um, is is one at the beginning, but uh, but the hazard ratio decreases over time. So that means the treatment becomes more and more beneficial for patients in terms of hazard ratio. And the survival function uh, is like this. So this is the survival function in the treated arm, and the black curve is survival function in the control arm. So in this case, you can see the ARE can be, the ARE also less than one. So that means if you think the hazard ratio 
the hazard ratio is uh, um, uh, the hazard ratio decreases over time, then the RMST based the test uh, is less powerful. And uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, the, the ARE can be as low as 0.7. So that means you need a 30% more patient or 40% more patient uh, to recover, to match the power of log ramp test. Right, so, uh, so here is the opposite, right? So at the beginning, there's a big treatment benefit, but gradually the treatment benefit disappears uh, approaching one uh, toward the end of your trial. Uh, so in those cases, there's early benefit. Uh, the the ARE actually greater than one. The log run, the, uh, the RMST is more powerful than log run test. And the log run test in this case, for example, need a 10% more patients to to recover to uh, in order to have the same power as the RMST based test, right? So it all depends on the alternative. Here is a more extreme case. Uh, the survival curve you can see still uh, the the treatment arm is above the control arm everywhere, right? So the survival curve did not cross, but the hazard ratio actually crossed one. So in the beginning you have the treatment is benefit is beneficial. Uh, but at the end of the study, actually, it's become harmful in terms of hazard uh, ratio. So in this case, you can see uh, the ARE is becomes uh, uh, greater than one, and sometimes uh, uh, RMST uh, is much more powerful than the log run test because the log run test would need 30% more patients to recover the power, right? So, but to be fair, they are reasonably close, right? Why? Uh, you can see uh, we, we can write both tests as a weighted uh, integration of uh, difference in terms of accumulative hazard function, and the only difference is the weight. And here, the, the log run test of the weight depends on the sensory distribution. And if you use uh, the RMST, based on the, the weight function only depends on the survival function here, does not depend on the sensory distribution. So actually, the sensory can have a big impact on the power. And here is the plot of the weight function. So you can see the weight function here. Uh, here is the log rank test. And here is the, the RMST based test. The log rank test, is, you know, it's a very close. The weight two weight function are pretty close. So for example, if the treatment benefit is very big here, then the two tests might have different power. But otherwise, uh, they are so close. That's why the power are very similar in this case uh, for both tests. Unless you know the alternative is very strange or the censoring pattern is very strange, you would expect a big difference. So uh, all in all, the, the RMST based test is pretty comparable in terms of power with the, the uh, with the log run test. And the second question, as I said, how how about the the selection of the truncation time point? So so actually we are puzzled by this question for a long time, but uh, Later, we realized actually the truncation time points can be selected as the largest follow up time in the RMST, which is very appealing. That means if you lost the patient, is uh, you know six years, right? No matter this patient is censored or or failure, we can estimate RMST and make inference up to that time point. So you don't need to select, you don't need to game the system. You based on your data you choose the largest follow-up time point, and you can show uh, some toxic normality, and uh, the, there, is a, there is a regularity condition. Uh, it's a pretty weak. Actually, if the patient enters the study uniformly over the uh, entire accrual period, then this condition was satisfied. You know, that, that means if the patient enters your study, uh, roughly the constant rate, right? It, especially the beginning period. Then, then this condition is satisfied. Then you can make inference you can, uh, up to the last time point uh, for RMST. So there are some subtle issues. Uh, so firstly, this is different from the Kaplan-Meier estimate, where we cannot make inference up to the largest follow-up time point. Uh, although Kaplan-Meier can last to the last time point, but strictly speaking, you cannot construct confidence interval to make any uh, statistical inference up at those time points. You have to truncate your Kaplan-Meier curve somewhat backwards 
and make inference of that such as confidence interval uh, t test. I mean, uh, performing hypothesis testing uh, up to that at those time points. But for RMST, you can you can go to the last time point uh, if those conditions were satisfied. And also, you can see the RMST up to this t hat, which is last time point, actually is a random variable. So we have to be careful about interpreting the results. For example, for in terms of confidence interval and the bias. So this part, the parameter we try to estimate, actually is a random variable rather than a constant. So here is a, a very simple, simple simulation. Uh, so you can see the last time point on average. Uh, so here, this column is much longer than, for example, we choose the time points. We truncate the Kaplan-Meier such that 5% of the patients still at risk, right? So we can substantially prolong uh, the truncation time point if we follow to the last time point. And you can see the coverage level of the confidence interval is still satisfied. So pretty much 95%, even for the patient for a very small sample size. And for two group comparisons, we also can push our uh, the time window to the largest uh, uh, to the minimum minimum of the largest uh, event time in uh, in two group uh, the fall off time in two groups right so uh, so which can be bigger than the time window valid the time window used in log rank test so in this case uh, we also did a simple simulation uh, in this case we assume proportional hazard assumption is true you can see the RMST the tau hat used in RMST versus in the, you know, we truncated the RMS, we truncated the RMST, uh, the time is much longer, right? And the power is comparable with the log run test, as we said, as the, you know, con further conforming our earlier claim, the two tests roughly have the same power. So, so this is, so if we compare this two, it's very interesting. So we can claim the RMST up to much longer time, right? We, over a bigger time interval. But uh, the power actually, you do not get much power. Um, so, so I think uh, this is about the interpretation rather than uh, the gaining of the power. But that also says you probably cannot game in the system to improve your power because I think uh, towards the end of your Kaplan-Meier curve, uh, the information is more or less becomes uh, uh, becomes less. So, so next question is how to perform. Uh, analysis of covariance, and uh, we can, uh, instead of uh, performing a Cox regression model, we can assume the RMST given covariance follows, uh, you know, also associated with uh, the covariance using through some kind of link function, right? So here we can use inverse probability weighting method to solve the corresponding estimating equation for estimating beta. The biggest assumption here is that we have to assume the censoring is independent of the covariance, right? And uh, uh, and also we can do non-parametric ANCOVA. I would not say much here it's, uh, because this is uh, not unique for the uh, RMST. So here actually it's a very nice thing so for the this method already implemented in SAS. You can say the PROC RMST rec in SAS. You can you can check the menu. You can run the previous analysis using in terms of RMST to study the association between a set of covariance and RMST. So, so also RMST can be extended to more complex settings. For example, you know, we can have competing risk. Uh, and also we can, you know, for example, in this case, the RMST uh, can be extended into the area under the so-called cumulative incidence curve with respect to each of the uh, the failure, uh, the cost of each of the failures. Um, so you can see uh, this is one example. And also RMST can be extended to handle recurrent events. So in this case, you can see, basically this is time to the first event, time to the second event, time to the third event. The RMST can be summarized into, essentially we split the, this uh, space into several regions, the RMST essentially is the area in each of those regions, right? And also, we can study the duration of response. You know, we oftentimes uh, in the in the clinical trial we study the duration of risk. We study we report the response rate, 
by, by time point, ignoring the censoring the progression information, we say, you know, by year one, there's 20% response rate. Uh, so which is uh, actually uh, problematic because there's the censoring we ignored, and also maybe people have response for the progress soon afterwards, and we did not penalize for those kind of things. So actually, in this case, you also have very nice way to estimate the duration of response using RMST. Basically, that can be represented as area between two survival curves. One is the time to progression. Another is the survival function to the uh, composite endpoint of the T1 and the T2, which, which one is the first. And of course, the inference is slightly complex because two kaplan meyer curves are correlated. So you can, you can estimate the duration of response using the kaplan meyer uh, using the RMST. And also the RMST can be extended to consider rather than the time window from zero to tau, you can consider from tau one to tau two, right? So you can compare uh, the expected lifetime within uh, any time window between two arms. So this is really appealing for comparing. For example, if you believe the survival benefit that only occurs later in the follow-up. And if you know this, for example, in this trial, if in this kind of uh, situation, if you do logram test or RMST over an entire period, it's problematic. But if you do RMST, uh, if you compare RMST uh, at later time window, then you gain a lot of power. Um, so lastly, I want to briefly talk about the real events analysis. So in this case, actually, the key is uh, if the event rate is very low, then you have to use some parametric model to make you to make it possible to make exact inference. So which means you do not rely on asymptotic approximations because number of events is very low. So in those cases, uh, if you are willing to assume a parametric distribution uh, for the survival for the survival distribution, then actually you can make an exact inference. For example, you might assume the survival function is that from exponential distribution. Why we can do that? Actually, there's some theoretical justification because uh, uh, the survival function at the beginning always can be uh, do a Taylor theory expansion can be approximate can be approximated by a linear function. That course that essentially says at the beginning of the survival function the survival distribution that's roughly uh, an exponential distribution, right? So if we are willing to assume an exponential distribution, actually you could uh, make inference. And before making inference, you can see uh, under a real event exponential distribution, the, the mean restricted mean survival RMST becomes essentially tau times one minus lambda zero times tau divided by two. So if you know lambda zero, you can estimate RMST. Also, you can estimate, uh, for example, difference between two RMST if you know the lambda zero, the difference between lambda zero and the lambda one. And, and you can make exact inference. So, the basic idea of exact inference, I, I wouldn't go into details. I'll put slides uh, online so you can check later. But the basic idea is you construct a confidence, uh, uh, you construct a confidence region for lambda one, lambda two. That's the exact confidence region. And then you can project the confidence region into the direction of lambda one minus lambda zero, the difference two of two rates. And, uh, that gives us an exact confidence interval for the difference of two rates, and uh, that the difference and that confidence interval can be translated into a confidence interval in RMST. So, uh, so I think I'm almost at the end of the, my uh, my talk. Uh, so here is a here is an example. So you can see, for example, you have uh, roughly 100 patients per arm, and there's no events. So you cannot estimate hazard ratio, but you can construct a confidence interval for lambda one minus lambda zero, which is a very small, very narrow confidence interval at zero. And the difference in RMST actually is plus minus 11 days out of two years. So it's very good, right? Um, the final message is uh, please use it. I think it's a very valuable alternative for hazard ratio. And uh, lastly, I want to Thanks to my collaborators, including you know Professor LJV, Ying Lu, and Hajimi, and uh, Bo, uh, Bo Huang from Pfizer, Li Hui from Northwestern, uh, Jinhua from uh, from Guangzhou, and uh, 
thank you for your attention. And and I guess uh, if you like, you can ask questions here. I know it's already at the end of the time. Thank you so much, Wu. Um, anyone has questions? We still have could have a one question. Can people hear? Yeah, the features. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. The the slides and the the, the video will be on the Da Shu's website. And the features exact test. Uh, uh, I think it does not account for the different follow-up time and the censoring. So, so different. So, I think it's uh, might not be directly applicable here. And also, feature test is focusing on the ratio. If you know for the two by two table, you have zero events, then you know the odds ratio, the confidence interval for odds ratio will be you know also from minus infinity to positive infinity, from zero to positive infinity. So, which is different from this method. Uh, yes, I think we try to convince FDA uh, for using RMST. I, I, I know there are some trials uh, conducted by, by Japanese company uh, already adopted RMST. And the, I think of, for now, the FDA's main concern is about the selection of the transition time point. But I think they, they are open for discussion. Uh, the weighted Kaplan-Meier, uh, weighted Kaplan-Meier essentially is a generalization of uh, uh, RMST difference because you know uh, if you put weight as one, then you becomes RMST. I think the biggest uh, advantage of RMST is interpretability. But if you really uh, want to gain power and you have very specific knowledge about the alternative, then at least from testing perspective, the weighted Kaplan-Meier can be more powerful. The problem is you do not, uh, it's harder to interpret the estimate. So nowadays we're emphasizing the estimand, right? The concept of estimand. So, uh, so, uh, so, so that's the price you have to pay if you want to use more flexible testing procedure. Uh, yes, the last time point uh, uh, is a random variable. So we actually are writing a paper, and it's close to be accepted by biometric. Probably I shouldn't say that, but uh, uh, but I, I uh, but but uh, but hopefully uh, they will be there. Uh, so we discuss about uh, what is the right interpretation for the last time point. So although it is a random quantity, but I think uh, the RMST up to that quantity is still interpretable because we still can uh, talking about the confidence intervals. We still can talk about the bias. So everything. Uh, we talk about in the regular inference can be carried there, but uh, uh, but there's some subtleties there. Uh, I think that's still uh, a fair price to pay uh, in terms of selecting a priori a fixed uh, truncation time points uh, because you might the, you might not be able to estimate RMST up to that pre-selected time points and also. Uh, or you might lose some information, you know, you ignore the information up to after that time point. But if you design the trial carefully from the very beginning based on RMST, probably this is not a big issue. Uh, Uh, yes, we will put the uh, we will put uh, the the video online. I think uh, we are at the end of the hour, and uh, thank you everybody for your interest for your uh, for your attention. And uh, please uh, uh, join uh, join Da Shu's other activities. I'm I'm pretty sure uh, there will be a rewarding experience for many of us. And uh, thank you. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Yes, I can hear you oh, now. <laughs>
the audio has a problem, none of us can say it. So I really want to appreciate all the uh, you know slides and the presentation you share with us. It is really good presentation, and I think a lot of us learn a lot. I always curious about RMC how we're going to use that in a real practice. I think I get a lot of my answers today. So everything will be shared on Dasha website, and we'll send the members uh, members to the list when it's available. So thank you. Um, Lou joining us today and thank everyone for the good discussion. Uh, hopefully we see you next time. Next time will be a very important adaptive design working group next month. So see you guys soon. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye.